a very warm welcome. You're joining us at Hyde Park on Other Than a 24. And tonight we will be talking about Sri Lanka's Air Force, Sri Lanka's airspace and air diplomacy, uh, especially given the fact that um, regional power play and uh, regional superpowers play a massive role in terms of Sri Lanka's, whether we discuss Sri Lanka's neutra neutrality or Sri Lanka's status of uh, non-aligned status. Um, going forward, um, we will be talking about the national security, um, whether airspace management is part of uh, the Air Force role and commercial opportunities available for Sri Lanka. That is beyond the Air Force purview for national security. Uh, I've invited to our studios um, the commander of Sri Lanka Air Force, Air Marshal Udeni Rajapaksa. A very warm welcome to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, commander, I'd like to start off talking about um, Sri Lanka's airspace. This as a whole, we understand it's important, but um, during the conflict, yes, um, we've, we've seen how important of a role the Air Force also played. But today, we're importantly and increasingly talking about the commercial aspects of it. But at, at the beginning of this conversation, I'd like you to take us through um, what this airspace is for us, what is under the Air Force purview, and what belongs to us, Sri Lanka. Thank you very much. To start with that question, mm -hmm. Actually, uh, the airspace, airspace is the area where air operations are taking place. It extends from the ground level to maybe up to 50, 60,000 feet. But uh, we need to clearly understand the responsibilities of airspace management lies both with the civil air traffic controlling system and also with the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And also, it is in different heights. You have different segments controlled under different uh, institutions. Uh, but as far as the Air Force role in the airspace management is concerned, we have a specific role to play as far as search and rescue uh, operations are concerned. Because, uh, and also providing certain information. Uh, we have a, uh, uh, an area called flight information region. Mm -hmm. It extends uh, hundreds of miles beyond the territorial boundaries. Where the Sri Lanka Air Force is supposed to provide search and rescue facilities for any kind of unforeseen situation. So that is a primary role of the Sri Lanka Air Force with regard to the commercial operations in the region. Because it is our responsibility because civil air operators are not capable of doing it. Okay. So we always try to keep up with the technological advancement in the world and also we try to coordinate with the regional players to get the assistance for such operations in the region. So when you speak about the uh, flight information region that you just mentioned, Commander, uh, is, this, is this only for rescue operations that Air Force extends your support? Um, or is there other collaborative efforts that uh, you engage in with regional players? Yeah, that's true. But the flight information region, the importance of flight information region, dem the demarcation as far as the Air Force is concerned, the primary role is search and rescue facilities mm -hmm. providing. Mm -hmm. And for civil uh, air traffic authorities and the civil aviation, they have a different role to play in that. Mm -hmm. They control the whole air traffic in that particular area, mm -hmm. beyond which they hand, out over to the, hand it over to the other countries to handle the air traffic. So this is how the flight information region is demarcated. And if you take, uh, uh, the example, if I take an example like MH370, I hope you can remember. So in such situation, it is even though it is the primary responsibility of the country where the flight, uh, where the flight information region is, but always we go beyond that. Mm -hmm. All the nations around that particular area come and support. Mm -hmm. Like in Sri Lanka, I can tell you, even within uh, our territorial waters, when uh, this uh, new diamond incident happened in uh, the eastern coast of Sri Lanka. Indians straight away came and helped us mm -hmm. to put out fire. So this is how the, we always have collaborative efforts and collaborative uh, organizations uh, within, the, within the region so that it is very easy for us to address such situation. Okay. Uh, I think you brought us to a very interesting area where you mentioned even with the tragedies of um, the catastrophes of the new diamond vessel or other uh, 
vessels that have that caught fire and uh, um, also other catastrophes that there is collaboration between air force uh, units of other countries um, how does this really play when it comes to countries in the region we know there is distancing and power play between countries mm. so does that affect how the air force operates i don't think so because uh, the war situation and the peace oper peace uh, peacetime operations are two different things mm -hmm. this distinctly all the nations have identified in case of a uh, natural calamity or any air accident or in such cases we always get together so that is by mandate, UN mandate. We always come and cooperate among ourselves to achieve the common objective. Whereas in, uh, in war situation, it is totally different. Mm -hmm. uh, when, you, when you say, uh, yes, war situation, it's different. But now, uh, Commander, uh, especially after the war, uh, the, 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 the whole scenario has changed, uh, especially with um, more and more um, political diplomatic um, factors coming into play especially with Sri Lanka's geographical location and uh, the maritime space and airspace has become increasingly important for us uh, in terms of what is ours and what is not so enlighten us how this how the Air Force uh, command really works when it comes to these countries um, who who have a claim and sometimes uh, push Sri Lanka um, especially with, with their relations with other countries? Okay, very critical question and very important, I understand. I hope everyone will understand mm -hmm. and accept the fact that we have been a non-aligned country right throughout the history. And uh, uh, as a country and also as the Sri Lanka Air Force operation, we will continue to do so. So as long as our interests are not dictated by somebody else's interest, we are very free. And we ensure that our interests are not compromised. We always try to collaborate and we try to assist the other nations and our boundaries are very clear. You know, we being an island nation, we have been so lucky, we have very clear boundaries and also we have very clear demarcation of all the flight information regions and exclusive economic zone and so on and so forth. So very, it is uh, by nature, it's a blessing that we have and I don't think we have any issues with any of the neighboring countries in the region. Who decides who can fly over Sri Lanka, what can fly over Sri Lanka? How does that decision making process happen? Okay, it is a quite complicated mm -hmm. process for a commercial operation for commercial routine operation for an airline simply. Mm -hmm. So they have their flight plan filing. So with that, they can just fly because they get the diplomatic clearance and they get the air defense clearance from the Sri Lanka Air Force. Then it is cleared. It is a planned flight. They can, uh, it's a routine operation. There is no restriction for that. They can carry out unless otherwise it is uh, diplomatically restricted. So in other than that, uh, we have separate uh, governing laws for military aircraft coming into uh, some somebody else's land. Mm -hmm. So then uh, we have to go through a special procedure. They have to apply it uh, uh, with a certain time gap so that uh, it has to go through the uh, diplomatic clearance through the Ministry of Defense and then the Air Force has to clear that particular flight. Then only they get the air defense clearance. So without air defense clearance anyway, none of the, none of the aircraft will fly within the region. Mm -hmm. so, so do you also reject um, aircraft uh, that, that seek approval to uh, fly over Sri Lanka? If we have any ambiguity of the purpose of the flight or if, uh, for an example, if we have the reasons to believe that they are carrying something unauthorized mm -hmm. and can be dangerous to our country or any passengers, so then we have the right to say no. Mm -hmm. Then we have to go into investigation and see what it is. Mm -hmm. In recent times, have you done so, Commander? Uh, not in the recent past. We have not come across such issues. But it probably during the time of war, is it? Uh, not even during the time of war, because normally this, I'm talking about the commercial operations mm. and the transport operation, not okay. offensive aircraft coming into our uh, airspace. Mm -hmm. And there have been certain instances where the intruders, uh, by mistake maybe, mm -hmm and maybe intentionally, but we always warn them and chase them out. 
Mm -hmm. That has happened actually quite frequently also. Uh, not sometimes manned aircraft, sometimes UAVs which are flying at very high altitude, mm -hmm. they come and uh, gather information. Mm -hmm. So when we get to know through our radar systems, uh, so we warn them and uh, we ask them to get back. Mm -hmm. So that's what once these uh, unauthorized uh, aircraft objects uh, uh, fly over Sri Lanka's airspace, um, you, you step in to deny access. I'm also asking this question, Commander, especially given the fact that in recent times, from last year, we did see the controversy surrounding the Chinese vessel that, uh, that uh, sought entry to a Sri Lankan port. Um, and there was concern from India, especially concerning their national security. So um, what is the approach that the Air Force takes when there is incidents that affect Sri Lanka's diplomatic relations with other countries, especially with neighboring countries, if they feel threatened with the kind of uh, aircraft that fly over Sri Lanka or seek entry or uh, authorization to fly over Sri Lanka? Of course, it's a very valid point. Mm -hmm. We always have a great concern about the interest of our neighbors. Mm -hmm. Even though we do not compromise on our national interest, we have a great concern about what India thinks, what China thinks, what USA thinks, because our non-aligned path is not normally disturbed by somebody else's action. However, if somebody else claims that it is, it is going to hamper their national interests, we always have a concern and we inquire into it. Mm -hmm. That is, I think, our rational responsibility because uh, the peaceful coexistence in the region is key for uh, our uh, sustainable development as well as a region and as a, uh, as a uh, single nation. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I understand that um, we, uh, Colombo, will be hosting an air symposium. Uh, with air diplomacy actually at the uh, at, at uh, the top of the agenda, uh, let's talk about this a little, Commander. We're bringing together regional um, commands, um, representatives, high-ranking officials uh, who will be talking about air diplomacy. What is the role here, if I may first ask, of Sri Lanka Air Force? Okay. Uh, first of all, I should say it is quite important for the Sri Lanka Air Force as an Air Force and also as a country. Mm -hmm. So very important. Let me tell you why. Everyone uh, understands that uh, Sri Lanka is not very powerful economically and also militarily as compared to many other powers in the region. Mm -hmm. We are not a regional power player so as the capabilities that we possess with us as an Air Force. Therefore, we have to understand we need the support of the others. So. Actually, however, we should also understand that the responsibility of protecting and safeguarding the Indian Ocean region lies with the Sri Lankan government. You cannot do away with that. So what we are trying to do through the Columbia Symposium is actually to create that platform for everyone to come and discuss mm -hmm. and to come to consensus. If you look at the recent past, we have an ever-growing situation with regard to security. If you look at the sea pirates, smugglers, asylum seekers, traffickers, and organized crime gangs, and so on and so forth. So if we do not handle this situation carefully, we will be compelled to drawn into a, a drag into a uh, losing situation, which we do not want to happen. Mm -hmm. Therefore, so that is why we always invite the regional and extra regional partners to come and have a, a dialogue with us so that they will come to common consensus and we will be able to develop uh, SOPs, standard operating procedures and policy decisions mm -hmm. so that that can be discussed at higher level, at the political level. Mm -hmm. uh, how important is this from a national uh, uh, point of view, policy? Uh, perspective, how important is it today, especially with the political authority and uh, other policy measures being taken together, uh, put together, how important is it really in today's context for Sri Lanka? Okay, um, let me uh, explain it to you like this. Now you see in the very uh, near future, maybe next week, in two, three days time, uh, we are going to have the uh, IORA conference. 
which at which the Sri Lanka is going to chair after 20 years. Mm -hmm. this, is, this actually I see as a great achievement for us. Because when the countries, the country leaders, when they come to consensus at that level, it is very easy for us to operate and come to consensus at the operational level. As the, as the military commanders and the air power practitioners, it is very easy for us to come to consensus when we have the basic understanding at the political level. So therefore, I think uh, we can keep hope that even the I, uh, IORA is going to uh, give us a good start. Mm -hmm. Uh, and especially with regionalism gaining unprecedented leverage in the present geopolitical uh, context, I'd also like to uh, talk about what kind of research work and what, what kind of studies will be taken into uh, consideration during these symposiums in line with uh, Sri Lanka's geopolitical, geo, uh, geographical location and trying to leverage that uh, commander. Uh, because this is becoming increasingly important for us. Okay, that is the core of uh, the Columbia Symposium. Mm -hmm. uh, good question. Um, let me first uh, bring your attention to what Alfred Thay Mahan once said. That's some time back, long time back. Whoever controls the Indian Ocean will dominate Asia, and the destiny of the world will be decided on its waters. This is what he had to say. But it is very importantly applicable even today. Therefore, I, let me now tell you the main theme of the Columbia Symposium. That actually is the fostering shared air interest in the Indian Ocean region, by, but at the same time by looking at the geopolitical cooperation, uh, complexities and compulsions. So therefore it is, so what I'm trying to say, it is a long standing issue that we are still trying to address. So that is why Columbia Symposium is so important and there, initially we have uh, actually five segments we are having. Initially, we are going to start with the airspace management, as you said. So there, we will, uh, basically we will talk about the new dimensions of air power, like the UAV operation, drone operation, which have gone beyond the control of the traditional uh, systems. Mm -hmm. So we, we want to discuss uh, the operations of uh, UAVs, drones, and some other uh, machines that are uh, of non-traditional nature. So airspace management, how safe the airspace is the question now. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we are going to discuss those things in the first place, mm -hmm. at the first segment. So that will be quite interesting. So all stakeholders will come and, well, because this is not a threat that only Sri Lanka is facing. Mm -hmm. So everyone is facing this threat. Uh, if I may interrupt, uh, how, um, let me ask you this question. How safe is Sri Lanka's air uh, airspace? Okay, as far as the Sri Lankan airspace is concerned, I should say we have a very safe airspace because we have the radar system and also we have the equipment, but provided we are looking at kind of a threat within, I mean, within our expectation. Like uh, I should tell you frankly, mm -hmm. we do not expect a threat from outside, an uh, intruding force a huge air force coming and invading Sri Lanka. You know, this is not what we are expecting. Actually, what we are concentrating today is about giving protection and air support or air surveillance assistance to the seagoing vessels and also the civil airliners in the flight information region. That is one area. Mm -hmm. And also, we want to provide protection for the aircraft which are flying in the domestic environment. Right. So we want to make sure that no hindrance uh, is happening for the uh, domestic care operations. And at the same time, the most critical threat today we are facing is from the drones. I think uh, we would like to speak more on this uh, Sri Lanka's Air Force, air power and air diplomacy once we come back after this short break. We are in conversation with the commander of the Sri Lanka Air Force, Air Marshal Udeni Rajapaksa. Do stay with us. We'll return soon.
Welcome back. You're joining us here at Hyde Park on Other There Are No 24. And we're in conversation with the commander of the Sri Lanka Air Force. Uh, I'd like to take our uh, conversation forward, especially on the contributions that the Air Force can make to, uh, to, to really helping Sri Lanka come out of this crisis, whether it's bringing in dollars or whether it's securing our own innovative skills um, and research and development. But first, we've, uh, what we know and what we've heard is that the Air Force is developing manless drones, and this is, uh, again, a brainchild of Air Force engineering. Correct me if I'm wrong, Commander. Your background is engineering. Your, uh, that, that's, that's your area of expertise. So tell us what the progress and process is today. A good question again, and first uh, let me correct you. Uh, my profession is uh, actually I, I'm a pilot. But I have an engineering background, of course, you're also right. Okay, uh, UAV, you're talking about UAV. And there are so many ways that we are trying to help the Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. And UAV, we started this research and development project uh, over 15 years. We have been doing it and we have come to, we have received good results. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I should say, we have been able to develop uh, we call it Linear Mark 1 and Linear Mark 2 UAVs. So we have been able to develop this to a level where we can fly up to 20 kilometers mm -hmm. at a height of 8,000 feet. So actually what we are trying to do now is to extend the range of operation up to 150 kilometers at a height of 15,000 feet. So this is what we are aiming at. To do that, sometimes you know the acquisition of technology is quite costly. Uh, actually, last week, we uh, started uh, uh, collaborating with the uh, Arthur C. Clark Center right. and also with the University of Moratua. Mm -hmm. We already signed MOUs to develop our UAVs project and also to develop the drone manufacturing project. We have two projects uh, at, uh, under the R&D uh, Air Force and I should say we, we plan to uh, develop the down link where you have, you, which, which increases the range of the, opera, uh, the machine from where it is operated. So that is going to be 150. So we are uh, working in collaboration with the University of Monitor. And uh, I should say, we have a plan to, uh, to start our commercial production of drones by next year. So actually, I should say, we are very proud to announce that from next year onwards, the, the other military operators and government operators at least will have to purchase, will purchase from our production because it will be much cheaper than the uh, purchasing it from outside. And UAV operation is a little uh, more comprehensive, I mean more advanced than drone operation So be because we, we need range. Mm -hmm. So that can be used for many sectors, maybe for agriculture, maybe for traffic controlling, maybe for surveillance, reconnaissance, for uh, counter criminal activities. So UAV is quite uh, uh, important, uh, I mean, project that we are looking at, but it will take a little over a year to come to reach that target. But right. drones, of course, we are already manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So d did you say, let me clarify, whether it, it's by the end of this year that uh, Air Force can uh, commercially uh, mobilize this aspect or? Uh, the drones. Yes. No, actually we have started manufacturing. Okay. But still you have to operate it for some time and you have to make sure mm -hmm. that it is up to that standard, the quality standard right. before you're giving it to, offering it to somebody else. So, so it will take about six months. Okay. Right. It will take total about six months because mm -hmm. we have already started the project but before you put it to commercial mm -hmm. uh, line, mm -hmm. so it will take about six months. So this also means we rely on uh, imports currently uh, and and Air Force will actually support uh, bringing some sort of uh, a revenue generation mechanism through this research and development uh, programs that you've entered into. Yes, we do. We do very much. And actually, we want to cut down the uh, importing uh, cost mm -hmm. uh, for Sri Lanka Air Force and also for the other organizations. So we will be able to provide at a much lesser cost to the other organization and also you see the other part of it it is uh, it is a security concern when a drone is uh, flown in sri lanka mm -hmm. so then we have a strict control over uh, the technology that we use mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. But currently, what are the challenges you face, especially with now you say, uh, once you have your own drones, there is a strict control over the technologies that are used. But what is the challenge now? Yes, uh, technology is something which is ever evolving. The technology that you purchase today will be of no use by six months time. Mm -hmm. The manufacturer might say, okay, we don't, we do not give you the software packages anymore for this particular hardware and you will have to purchase the next generation one. So that is what we want to avoid. So we have enough and more experience by purchasing again and again and spending a lot of money. So we are trying to develop it by ourselves with the support of the other institutions who are capable in Sri Lanka and also we are going to get the support from the overseas organizations as well. And then it is not purchasing the technology, it is transfer of technology. Mm -hmm. We transfer technology from some other institution to our country so that we develop uh, the software uh, solutions for that. Mm -hmm. So then we have a strong control over what we do. Mm -hmm. And to even to develop from to the next step, so we have uh, know-how, technical mm -hmm. know-how to that. Okay, so we have our own authority, independence there. Uh, you, you mentioned about the U, uh, the, the other, other project. Uh, UAV. UAVs. Um, you said, how, what is what is really the commercial benefit of it and what's the, uh, educate us on this. Uh, the, the purpose, the, uh, the, the really strength that Sri Lanka Air Force gets out of it and the commercial aspect to it. Actually, uh, if you uh, look at it like this, it will be very much useful in uh, agriculture. And we can use it for coastal surveillance and maritime reconnaissance and all for surveying. You see, uh, to do survey in Sri Lanka, we have to spend a lot to get the aircraft from outside and to get these cameras fixed into it and to fly. So if you have good sophisticated UAV to fly around and to get the mapping done, so that will cut down a huge amount of money. Um, you mentioned about agriculture. This also takes uh, us to uh, weather, weather intelligence also. Um, how, does, how does the Air Force rely on the kind of intelligence? We speak of intelligence, information, other kinds, but weather plays a massive role in uh, your line of work. Um, what do you rely on? Actually, the concern about whether I know what you are referring to is sometimes it's not reliable, right? Mm -hmm. That is what you want mm -hmm. to highlight. I should say, uh, you know, because of this uh, environmental issues, the weather pattern in the whole world is changing. We lying very close to, we, is, we are sitting very close to the equator, the complexity is more. Because we don't have very demarcated season where the weather is very prone to change, uh, I mean, within two, three minutes time. So there is an issue. But uh, when you use UAVs, the way that you can use UAVs for, to observe weather, because it can go and see, get the information at a far range, where the effect is going to uh, be where you are, maybe after two, three hours, but still you can get the correct information without, without assuming things. You can get the real-time information through UAVs. Mm -hmm. And also I should say, we were talking about cloud seeding. We were I'm to sorry? cloud seeding. Mm -hmm. That is to get artificial rain. Mm -hmm. So in, in such kind of uh, operations, we can make use of UAVs. But the, not the UAV that we have produced. It is much smaller, but uh, we are in the path. We're in the path, and there's definitely room for expansion and development. Um, uh, you mentioned about uh, how uh, the, the accurate prediction of uh, rainfall or whether it's drought can help us. We saw in the recent past again how our farmlands, agricultural crop was destroyed because we didn't have sufficient uh, information to predict the drought, to, to keep our farmers on the loop and uh, prepare ahead of time. Um, so what is today's role of the Air Force again from the traditional role of uh, providing um, air security, supporting, um, uh, supporting the other uh, armed forces uh, in ensuring national security? What is the changing role today and how could you really support Sri Lanka's economy going forward, especially given the current economic context, um, with the kind of research and development that you're engaged in? 
Okay. Uh, to start with, as I told you, we can of course go for commercial production mm -hmm. in drones, and we try to do commercial production of UAVs. That of course, in collaboration with uh, uh, some partners from overseas, mm -hmm. that will take some time because it is a tough business <laughs> because we have to compete with the other competitors in the world. That is also there, and also uh, I should say. Uh, the weather, as you said, uh, let me correct uh, you a little bit because it was not that we did not know that drought was coming. We knew that drought was coming, but we were limited with options to address that. Like uh, if you take a country like uh, Thailand, they have systems. Actually, they have come here some time back and we have done that part as well. Uh, we have done our research and we are developing on those lines. So actually, His Excellency the President uh, gave us directions to do research and development on that area. Because that is what I said, when you do not get rain, you need to get artificial rain if okay. you really want. So this is how you manipulate things for your advantage. And on the other hand, when you, when you are about to get harvest, then if it is going to rain, you should be able to stop rain. Mm -hmm. So this is how the countries have developed system. This is what we are looking at now. The Air Force in collaboration with the Agriculture Department and Power and Energy Department Ministry. And uh, so we, are, we have launched a program to develop such things. Mm -hmm. uh, cloud seeding you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, what, is, what is the span of work that uh, Air Force can be really engaged in here? Uh, because it sounds economically very beneficial for Sri Lanka, just as you mentioned, uh, as Thailand uh, utilizing it. But going forward, wha what support can the Air Force be giving here? Of course, it is the application of air power. Mm -hmm. We have to provide aircraft, we have to provide skill uh, manpower, we have to provide air crew and pilots who, who should gain experience on type and should be able to undertake such tasks along with the other professionals in the other agencies. So of course, uh, the, at least 50% of the tasks, the, the, the effectiveness of the task will lie with the Sri Lanka Air Force. So we have a huge responsibility in doing that. That is why we are carry, very keen to uh, uh, get into that subject. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy to contribute to uh, the question that you asked earlier about the, how we can support the Sri Lankan government. Uh, by other ways. Uh, I should say, I am very proud to say that the Sri Lanka Air Force is undertaking UN peacekeeping missions. Through that, we have been able to uh, bring over 100 million US so far as direct uh, transfer to the Treasury. But that is apart from the salaries of the uh, Air Force men that we have developed, uh, deployed in uh, UN missions in African continent. We have three helicopters and 120 odd men in one contingent. So that is, uh, uh, actually it is a very good opportunity for us to uh, display and showcase our professionalism to the uh, world. Mm -hmm. So we have gained a lot of reputation by employing, uh, deploying our troops in the UN missions. Uh, so that is very good for uh, for the Sri Lanka as a nation and for the Sri Lanka Air Force, for our reputation. And also it's an income generation measure. You see, uh, on the other hand, apart from those two main things, you know, for a pilot or an air crew or engineer, he needs to practice. The moment you fly for one hour, it is fuel cost and the aircraft operating cost. So why not you go and fly it for another purpose where you get experience in some other country in a different location, still you make money. So without just wasting, you know, there is no reason for you to just fly to get experience. So this is another opportunity that we are exploring into and that will make a lot of money for the government. Mm -hmm. uh, that's definitely a very interesting and very welcome uh, uh, information given Sri Lanka's present context. Um, underutilized opportunities, if I may say. Um, uh, 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 talking about the civil aviation sector, Commander, what really opportunities lie ahead for Sri Lanka especially? Because uh, I've been talking about commercialization. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, is there a role that the Air Force can play with other, whether it's corporate, whether it's other sectors who are interested in um, uh, 
paying a premium or, uh, or engaging in commercial activity where um, the Air Force holds authority over. Okay, again a critical question because uh, our organization, the Sri Lanka Air Force is not designed to undertake commercial operation. However, I must say we are very flexible. By nature, air power is application of air power is very flexible. That's one of the characteristics that we have. I hope you can remember after the war, we, we helped uh, the civilian uh, domestic flying a lot. We started our Heli-2 operation. We, start, we undertook a lot of uh, commercial, uh, domestic commercial operations in, the Sri, in Sri Lanka. That is to boost up the tourism industry and also as a helping hand to the commercial operators, domestic commercial operators in Sri Lanka. We have done a lot to the commercial aviation industry. And I'm, uh, I'm very proud to say for the first time in the history, yesterday I signed an MOU with the Sri Lankan Airlines. Mm -hmm. That was appeared in the papers, I saw it today. For training. Aviation for training, training, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. that the, through that, we try to, we, we have our plans to collaborate so many things. The facilities that we have in the Sri Lanka Air Force can be shared with the Sri Lankan Air Force technicians, engineers, and pilots. And similarly, so they are going to offer us their simulators and their training facilities for Air Force engineers and pilots. So this is going to be, you know, always what I and the Air Force believes is one plus one is more than two. It's a synergistic effect that we are expecting. Mm -hmm. uh, this could also be one aspect to look at, especially we are talking about uh, restructuring state-owned enterprises, commercializing them. Um, those enterprises that are a burden to the Sri Lankan economy can be restructured, can be reutilized with these innovative measures and a thought process that brings us more revenue generation. Um, take us through, Commander, now, um, what you really plan for the Air Force now. Uh, you've to spoken about uh, the, the opportunities that lie ahead, the kind of research and development work uh, that, that um, the Air Force is engaged in. But going forward, especially with Sri Lanka's um, policy uh, aspirations, and we are talking about Defense 2030 policy, uh, the airspace, Air Force, Air Power has a massive mandate and strong contribution that you could play to this defense role also. So where do you want to take uh, Sri Lanka Air Force? Very good question. Once again, uh, let me start like this. First, uh, we, should, we should know where we are mm -hmm. and where we want to be. After the end of the war, conflict situation, we were in a different setup. Because I hope uh, you may remember that we had to induct a, a, a large number of ground troops for the Sri Lanka Air Force. So that had gone out of proportion from a unique Air Force. So we being an Air Power practitioner and being a commercial, sorry, being an Air Force, then we are supposed to have some ideal composition as an Air Force. Mm -hmm. So actually what now we are trying to do is to reduce the the ground troops and to increase the technical force and also the pilots. So we are trying to be a unique care force. So that is one thing. And I should also say that restructuring of the Sri Lanka Air Force is not new concept for us. If you look at the facts and figures, end of the war, we had 35,000 people in the Air Force. So far, we have gradually reduced, and now we are at 26,000 plus. That's the strength of the Air Force currently. As at now. We are, we are gradually, uh, but I don't, I don't try to say that we are reducing the increase in the capacity of the Air Force, but we are trying to uh, acquire technology, and we are trying to be a unique Air Force. We are, we are getting back to the unique role of the Air Force rather than uh, you know, having a ground uh, uh, fighting forces, a uh, large number of ground fighting forces. That is what we are aiming at. And at the same time, uh, we have our plans to replace the manned soldier with the smart soldier. Mm -hmm. So we ha have our plans at least by end of August next year, we will try and establish perimeter defense through the smart soldier. That may be 
using use of uh, UAVs, maybe drones, or some other missions, so that we have we can reduce the number of manpower involvement and increase the technological use, so that it will be accurate, and uh, so it will make our task easier. Mm -hmm. uh, when you say the usage of technology, Commander, uh, there are massive challenges we can also uh, face uh, in the future with technology. Uh, so do you think uh, this uh, a downsized air force, but a smarter air force again, as you say, uh, is equipped with the technological knowledge, know-how and expertise now? Is there an upgrade happening there? Of course. Very relevant question. Uh, first, let me correct. It's not downsizing. Mm -hmm. I don't uh, accept the word downsizing. So it is actually right sizing. So we are getting back to a different role where we need to change the composition, the whole composition of the Air Force. That is what That's I mean. That's understood. With the, the, during the conflict time, yeah. um, massive manpower was necessary. Yeah. Now, okay. okay. And we are going to compromise that and to bridge that gap through the technological advancement and the acquisition mm -hmm. of technology. And also, I must say, practical examples, like uh, uh, we have now the aircraft earlier. We had to send the aircraft for major holes and repairs for some other countries, which we have reduced to a great extent now. Mm -hmm. For an example, we do not send K-8, White Whale aircraft, PT-6, Bell 212 aircraft, Bell 412 aircraft anymore to any other countries. We do the full overhaul of the aircraft and all the servicing and repairs in in-house Sri Lanka. So therefore, you see, we have improved our facilities a lot. And we have a, a formation called Aircraft Overhaul Wing at Katunayaka where we undertake such facilities. And also we have some other, other uh, supporting uh, facilities, engineering uh, organization within Sri Lanka like Aeronautical Engineering Wing, Surface Treatment Plant, and ASW, and I mean so many uh, uh, supporting organizations to assist them. And we undertake the full overhaul in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. so uh, w when we talk about the weaponry strengths of the Air Force, does this mean we will rely more on uh, technology going forward and, uh, uh, and do away with the traditional approaches? Okay, uh, that is something that we will have to do a little later. Like the, the weaponry system are very sensitive, which you just can't acquire all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. But we are trying to do it like the, by using drone technology. Right. By using uh, UAV technology, you can it, it, we will develop it to a level where it can carry ammunition. Mm -hmm. So that is what we are doing through research and development. Mm -hmm. But I don't tell, I can't tell you timelines as to when we are going to achieve that target to use the uh, weapon delivery uh, through the uh, use of UAV or drones. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there is a talk about uh, expanding or collaboration in terms of the Indian Ocean region. Uh, whether it's the maritime or airspace. Uh, this also means there are uh, conflicts in the region. Um, how are we going to manage this, especially uh, India, our closest neighbor? We're collaborating, we are uh, sensitive to the security concerns of India, and then there is Pakistan, who is a close friend of Sri Lanka, just as India is. Um, so with that, where does the Air Force stand? Okay. Uh, as far as the Sri Lanka Air Force is concerned, we don't have any friction with any of the nations in the region or even beyond. Mm -hmm. They do have, they understand sometimes we hear and we can see the things uh, which are happening. But we try to manage our interest area to the way that we want. Like, uh, but our concern here is not on those areas, but our concern is the non-availability of a strong structured cooperative measures within the region. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say is, if you look at Europe, they have NATO, they have EU, economic cooperation and defense cooperation, military cooperation. They have, on the other hand, in the eastern sector, we have ASEAN, Southeast Asia, ASEAN for cooperation, and also uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Such regional bodies are there. They are very much structured. They have regulatory mechanism. We are in the South Asia, we don't have such. I don't say we don't have, but you say if you look at an organization like SARC, when they did meet last, that was in 2014. And even if we meet, how effective is SARC? Exactly. That is what our concern is. 
You know, if something goes wrong, who is going to control it? Who has authority? What is regularized? So that is what we are going to achieve through the Columbia Symposium. The consensus building up and also regularize the, the, the actions and also establish policies among uh, the nations in the region. So that is what we are actually trying to do. Mm -hmm. But otherwise I should say individually, uh, we as a nation, we are proud to, uh, I'm very proud to say that we get a lot of support from the regional actors and also well beyond the region also. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wish to mention that uh, the support that we got during our economic turmoil, actually we got uh, uh, aviation fuel from Australian government, free of charge to carry out uh, surveillance and reconnaissance in the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. And also they are going to, they have already offered and they are going to give us a beach 350 aircraft which is a very good platform for reconnaissance and reverse surveillance that will create a situation where we can have a much larger scope in the maritime domain awareness. Mm -hmm. So that is going to, they are going to donate us. And not only in the region, but I should tell uh, even USA, they have promised to give us Beach King 350ER with a very advanced technology uh, on board so that we can do a lot of uh, activities in the Indian, Indian uh, uh, Ocean region. And also I must tell you the support that we get from uh, China and India as well. Because India, you, I don't have to tell you, you saw it on papers. I mean, we got a Donia 228 aircraft from Indian uh, Navy. So that has be, been there over a year. And that has been uh, one and only machine sometimes uh, uh, for us uh, to do reconnaissance and surveillance in the Indian Ocean. And if you look at the intelligence aspect is concerned, we get a lot of support from India and also from Pakistan. Mm -hmm. We always get. And what about China? They're also supporting us because we being non-aligned, we are friendly with everyone. So we get the support from almost all the nations in the world. Mm -hmm. then, then that also brings uh, us to question then the efficacy of SARC once again, just as in other uh, areas, to maintain an effective for air power capabilities, um, air forces in the Indian Ocean region must collaborate and be tightly knit. Um, so once again, how will this symposium commander uh, at least attempt to bring um, the key uh, countries or SARC together uh, so that we have an effective collaboration. You s spoke about uh, the NATO and other closely knit regions where they use their uh, network or regional collaboration for their advantage. So how can Sri Lanka actually play um, a leading role here to bring these countries together? Yeah, I think uh, uh, more than the Columbia Symposium, the IORA, mm -hmm. which we are going to chair maybe two, three days time. So that will be the ideal platform to start off. So that we will, that will uh, down the line, we will have some authority for us to discuss and come to consensus. Okay. That is one thing. Okay. And uh, as far as the Columbia Symposium is concerned, I should say, we have invited papers and we have invited uh, intellectuals and practitioners to come forward and present their papers in the Columbia Symposium from many countries. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, within the time frame, we cannot accommodate everyone. But uh, the team of uh, 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 academia, they have selected some papers. We have mm -hmm. papers from, of course, from Sri Lanka Air Force as the host. And also we have papers from Lakshman Khadiragama Center and Institute of National Security Studies. We have papers from UK. And also, we have invited scholars, uh, intellectuals, and air power practitioners from UK, USA, China, India, Pakistan, Malaysia. Actually, our keynote speaker is from Malaysia. Mm -hmm. So actually, we have a whole lot of uh, practitioners, air power practitioners all over the world coming in. And we have invited all the uh, diplomatic community based in Sri Lanka, and also the, all the defense attaches based in India also to come and participate in this. So it's, it's a, it's a it's a platform with all kinds of uh, nationalities so that it will, uh, so we are looking forward to have a very fruitful session. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, we have invited in the local, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, colleges like universities and especially the National Defense College, the students and also the faculty and uh, Defense Services Command and Staff College. We have invited all the academia and air power practitioners to come and uh, have a dialogue face to face 
because sometimes the the biggest issue in the region mm -hmm. is misperception and misunderstanding like i don't know how you think about this problem mm -hmm. and i don't know how you think about me so this is the ideal platform for them to come forward and talk have a dialogue face to face then most of the problems can be sorted out that level that is what we expect through the uh, air power symposium kolombia symposium Right, I think it's time we wrap up, but we have about two minutes. You're the 19th commander of the Sri Lanka Air Force. It has been a, a long journey. Let's just give us a recap of your journey here. Um, changing times, conflict to uh, today we're talking about uh, complexities of uh, economies, uh, regional power players we've been talking about, superpowers in the Air Force in the midst of all this, and today you're the commander. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, giving me this opportunity and also we got to understand we are shifting. It's a paradigm shift. We are shifting from traditional threat to non-traditional threat. So it is important for us to understand what kind of threat, threat that we are uh, that going to pose. Mm -hmm. So then we should be prepared. So have a proactive approach. So that is what we are aiming at. So in that case, I think it is important for us to acquire technology and to do a lot of concept innovation because the government cannot invest on technology for us. So we have to do a, a lot of things within. So that is what we are doing, a lot of collaboration with the other universities and international uh, companies and organizations. And also we, were, we are trying to make money for our government mm -hmm. while uh, reaching our target as well. So we, say we plan to send more and more UN missions so that will bring us experience and it will give us money and also it will uh, take the Sri Lanka Air Force to greater heights in the international arena. Mm -hmm. so that is also one of the important things that I uh, expect and also we strongly believe as the Sri Lanka Air Force collective security as a small nation collective security is a must. We should somehow push all these uh, regional power players into collective security mechanism. This is where uh, we should be aiming at. This is achieving that is very vital. And also I should say, Colombo Air Symposium, finally, which is going to start on the 9th at Rathmalana uh, Convention Hall, is going to be a platform for everyone to come and discuss. Mm -hmm. Whoever who wants, again, they can call Air Force. Also we will, if there are any special cases, we are, uh, we are ready to welcome anybody who can come and contribute. And that, that's, that's good to hear. Academics, those interested in this topic, can uh, be a part of this symposium. Thank you very much, Commander, for your time. And let's hope that Air Force will, uh, in some way, try to bring SARC together and bring our region to be a more commercially and uh, connected, power-connected um, regional economy. Thank you for your time. Um, we were in discussion with the 19th Commander of the Sri Lanka Air Force, um, Air Marshal Udeni Rajapaksa, talking about Sri Lanka's air power, airspace, and uh, Air Force's changing role in today's uh, changing geopolitical scenario. We'll see you again next week at the same time with yet another discussion. Thank you for watching. Have a pleasant evening. Good night. <laughs>